Okay, members, it's time for questions to the Minister for the Economy. I call Emma Rogan to ask the first question. Emma Rogan. Question one. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you for the question. I have met with representatives from the Association of Northern Ireland Travel Agents, and I understand the extent to which the sector has been impacted by this pandemic, both locally and on a global scale. I have also um, met uh, with uh, one of our foremost uh, local travel agents, Mr Mukesh Sharma. Travel agents have been able to avail of support provided by both the UK Government and the Northern Ireland Executive throughout this period, including the three business support schemes introduced by my own department. Travel agencies would have been eligible for assistance through the Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme, the Self-Employment Income Support Scheme, the Rates Relief Packages and the Business Interruption Loans. With ongoing restrictions in travel and a lack of confidence among the public, I believe there is a strong case for specific financial support for this sector. To this end, I am aware that the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, accompanied by the Finance Minister, met with representatives from the Association of Northern Ireland Travel Agents just last week. I await their recommendations from this engagement and any follow-up executive decision in relation to this. Emma Rogan, supplementary. Minister, your own tourism recovery steering group, along with NILGA, have acknowledged that despite decline in our tourism sector, that in all Ireland tourism has increased and that that has helped to ensure that our hotels and our B&Bs can stay in business. You, you touched upon it there now, Minister. Um, will you bring forward a specific proposal to ensure the growth in this sector and to compensate for the loss of tourism for overseas? As I uh, indicated to you, and, and first may I comment on, on the preamble to your question, um, in that yes, tourism um, from the Republic of Ireland has increased um, very, very significantly um, over uh, the past number of months, um, given uh, the promotions around staycations and the fact that people um, were unwilling to travel abroad. So we have benefited in Northern Ireland from significant numbers of visitors from the Republic of Ireland um, in uh, Northern Ireland. And that is a good thing and something that we hope uh, will continue and a market that we think that we can expand. Um, of course, um, as I've said uh, in the answer uh, to my question, uh, or to your question, um, I understand and recognise the very grave difficulties that travel agents in particular and those who visit overseas have uh, been impacted by the travel restrictions, uh, etc. Um, and I do believe that there is a case for intervention from the executive um, and I understand that they have met with the finance minister and the first and deputy first minister and the executive will take a further decision when there's a proposal. I call Jonathan Buckley. And I thank the, the Minister for her answer thus far. I indeed have met with various representatives from the travel industry and know acutely, and I know she does as well, uh, the pain that they're facing at this time. It's hard to we ensure the industry rebounds from what has been undoubtedly a very difficult period. Would the Minister agree with me that we should be looking at giving a rates holiday to these types of businesses, given the length of the tail of recovery that we will expect? Yes, I've, uh, can I thank the member for his question, and uh, yes, I do think that we will need uh, to look at maybe a, an immediate intervention, but also a longer term intervention, something like uh, rates relief for the next year. Um, these businesses do have a good future, but uh, the tale of recovery from COVID is long for them, uh, and uh, the road perilous in that recovery, um, and I would like to see them being supported. I call Jim Allister. The Minister says that she is um, sympathetic and supportive and all those encouraging words. But this situation has been known about for months. It's, it's certainly some weeks, if not months, since I and a new other MLAs wrote to her about this very subject. So my fundamental question is, why is it that there is yet no package? Why has it not happened? Because travel agents work on a very peculiar system in terms of the impact on their cash flow, whereby when holidays are cancelled, money they've already taken has to be repaid, commission repaid, and they lose on all sides. That's been known for months. So why the delay? 
Again, can I thank the member for his question? Um, uh, the member will recall um, that I've said many times in this House um, that I had put forward um, a list of people uh, who still uh, required help, and of course, travel agents um, are among that very long list. These are, of course, whole executive decisions, and the decisions are taken by the whole executive with the money um, that is available through the finance department of the executive. Um, I think um, we are now clear, um, having had uh, further allocations from the money that was originally allocated to the Finance Department in July uh, from the economic <coughs> statement by the Chancellor then. Um, and uh, I think that there should be financial help forthcoming. I hope that it will be in the very near future. Moving on, I call Philip McGuigan. Uh, Kest uh, Everadaw, question number two. My department is currently undertaking a review of the petroleum licensing regime. To inform that review, the department has commissioned independent research to provide a detailed assessment of the economic, environmental and social impacts of onshore oil and gas exploration and development in Northern Ireland. This will be a detailed piece of work covering a wide range of complex issues. The researchers have been asked to consider the policy context of UK climate commitments, petroleum policy elsewhere in the UK, as well as the Republic of Ireland and Europe, and the impl implications of Northern Ireland's developing energy strategy. It is anticipated that the research will take up to six months to complete. Similar regionally specific research has shaped petroleum policy in Scotland, Wales, England and the Republic of Ireland. The research will provide a solid regional evidence base on the impacts of petroleum licensing in Northern Ireland. The department will use the information gathered to consider options and develop through stakeholder engagement and consultation evidence-based petroleum policy proposals. This will include the need or otherwise for a future petroleum licensing regime. Good. Uh, can call you. Uh, given the negative uh, environmental and societal uh, impacts of onshore drilling for oil and gas, I mean there is obviously a need for action. And Minister, given what you have said about countless other uh, studies taking place on these islands and further afield, uh, and given that these studies have shown that the practices are deeply damaging to the environment and health and well-being of the population, uh, w will you commit to end fracking uh, and then? conventional exploration for fossil fuels? I have currently commissioned um, the evidence and the research uh, into this so that we will have a solid uh, way forward in terms of the policy in relation to this particular issue. I do not wish to preempt um, either the, the proposals, the, the research, or indeed um, any further proposals and consultation that the department will do on uh, this particular issue. However, this is clearly a contentious cross-cutting issue, and the final decision in relation to this will, of course, be taken by the executive as a whole. Nicole Stewart, Dixon. Minister, could you tell the House how you see the future of fossil fuel exploration aligning with your uh, desired need to bring Northern Ireland to a zero net carbon and tackle climate change? Can I thank the member for that very, very important question? As the member is aware, um, I recently uh, published uh, the Rebuilding a Stronger Economy. And one of the four pillars in that Rebuilding a Stronger Economy is the need to see a clean, a clean green recovery uh, for Northern Ireland. And I do see this as a huge potential for the way forward. Indeed, uh, the um, sector already uh, provides a significant number of jobs um, and contributes significantly to the economy in Northern Ireland. And I do think that that is where the future um, for uh, energy lies. Um, however, we have to make solid proposals, uh, policy proposals. Those proposals must be based on evidence and on research. Uh, and that is what we are currently doing and will continue to do. Well, Steve Egan. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and may I thank the Minister for uh, our answers so far. Uh, the Minister will be aware that at COP26 uh, later on this month, 
And one of the things that COP26 will be looking at very closely at is the de uh, move towards decarbonisation. Could the Minister say what conversations she's had with both the Welsh and Scottish Government? And this could be a great opportunity for all the regional governments in the United Kingdom together to come and use this opportunity to ban fracking. Well, again, uh, very topical, uh, and thank you for the question. Just last week, I was engaged um, with um, the, uh, Michael Gove uh, and my counterparts in Scotland and indeed in Wales uh, on a variety of these issues, and, and the overall topic was economic recovery. It's interesting to note that every constituent part of the United Kingdom saw a, a clean green recovery as being essential to the future and that that decarbonisation policy was uh, a, an essential part of economic recovery as well. Every part of the United Kingdom saw the opportunity for economic recovery in focusing on clean energy. I want us to get to that stage in Northern Ireland uh, and I look forward to bringing forward my energy strategy uh, in the early part of next year uh, and in the meantime uh, to continue to work uh, with the sector uh, on this particular trajectory. Moving on, Nicole Emma Sheeran. Right, can Carly Kesh over three, please? Questions, please. Sorry. Thank you um, for your question. Um, at the outset of this question, I, I want to say that I continue to oppose frictions in trade in any direction um, between uh, Northern Ireland uh, and its greatest market uh, in Great Britain and the resulting costs to businesses that arise from the implementation of the protocol. And for those in this House uh, who call over and over again for the full implementation of the protocol. They should be aware of the uh, conversations in the news uh, last week from Sainsbury's and a number of other companies who re re raise very, very significant fears about the cost to consumers, the choice for consumers, and the cost to business in Northern Ireland um, from our particular situation. However, um, in specifically answering the question, the Executive has made it clear that the UK Government should provide funding and support to Northern Ireland businesses if they are in any way impacted at the end of the transition period. Work has been ongoing for some time to help businesses prepare. InvestNI offers a range of support services to companies and Intertrade Ireland's Brexit Advisory Services provides financial and professional support I continue to urge businesses to take up this support. The Trader Support Service Portal is live and will provide guidance and support to Northern Ireland businesses and organisations that receive goods from GB or the rest of the world. I welcome the fact that the United Kingdom Government is funding this service and I would encourage businesses to register. While we recognise the need for support, businesses tell us that what they most need is clear information to enable them to prepare. And I will continue to press government to take on board the concerns of businesses and to provide them with urgent clarity and guidance on these matters. Emma Sheeran, supplementary. Laura Maggot, Ken Corley. Minister, thank you for your answer. You made reference there to the transition period and you'll be aware that uh, the clock is ticking uh, towards the end of the transition period at this stage and for a lot of businesses time is running out. Would you accept that in the event of a no deal Brexit we won't get the, the clarity that we need and therefore uh, plans must be in put in place as a matter of urgency? Well, I'm not as pessimistic uh, as the member. Uh, I do think um, that uh, both the European Union and our own government is committed to getting a deal. I think that is in the interests of all parts of the United Kingdom and indeed in the interests of French farmers, French fishermen uh, and many people and communities from across uh, mainland Europe as well. Um, I, uh, will uh, continue to advocate for Northern Ireland businesses on this issue. However, what we do need and what we, we need to get is to get to a sense of what is unfettered access, what, how, what will a Northern Ireland qualifying good be, how will we uh, instigate uh, anti-avoidance measures to stop Northern Ireland being a backdoor into uh, the United Kingdom, and very, very importantly, 
Will the European Union commit to actually exempting large portions of trade between GB and Northern Ireland uh, from those uh, health certificates uh, that they're currently requiring? Those cost uh, significant amounts of money, significant bureaucracy. And if, as Michel Barnier has often said to me in many conversations, that he wanted to be uh, imaginative uh, and innovative in the way that he implemented uh, the protocol, this is one step the EU could take right now. Call Matthew O'Toole. Mr. Speaker, just at the start, I think it's worth being clear that if anyone in this House in this assembly is able to talk about costs to business from Brexit, be they from north-south data flows or implementation of the protocol, it's no one from the Democratic Unionist Party which brought these problems on the people and businesses of Northern Ireland. Let's be absolutely clear about that. But since the Minister is in front of us, can I ask her, I agree with much of what she said in relation to qualifying goods and several other questions that, that are outstanding, can I ask her when she's going to come to the assembly and give a fulsome update to businesses and households in Northern Ireland about what the Department and Executive is doing. Can I also specifically ask whether she will support calls for Northern Ireland businesses to be included in European Union free trade agreements because there is an enormous benefit to Northern Ireland businesses and if that can be agreed with Brussels and London, it's something where we can get, genuinely get some of the benefits of both uh, markets. I would uh, start off my answer by reminding uh, the member that this is a matter of democracy. The United Kingdom voted as a whole to leave the European Union, and we are part of that United Kingdom, and so therefore we will be leaving the European Union. What we now have to make sure that we do is to ensure that Northern Ireland leaves on the very best terms. I, of course, do not see the protocol as the very best terms for Northern Ireland leaving the European Union. And as we now know that there are costs and bureaucracy involved in that protocol, and I would call on the European Union to instigate measures immediately that will actually help Northern Ireland to navigate the protocol so that retail, for example, will be exempt from checks uh, um, coming from GB to Northern Ireland. That would significantly help the people of Northern Ireland if the European Union were minded to do so. Um, in relation uh, to the costs of businesses, uh, to businesses. Um, I think everyone accepts that the protocol involves significant uh, cost to businesses. Um, I have, um, just as a, a preamble for this uh, particular part of questions, looked at what uh, the department is already doing uh, in relation to that. So we have the EU exit resilience tool, the Brexit preparation grant, the advice and webinars uh, and information and support on InvestNI websites. We have the Intertrade Ireland Brexit Advisory Service, the Brexit Planning Voucher, uh, etc. But the most important thing is clear information. I don't think we'll see that until we actually see the shape of a deal. And I accept that businesses find that incredibly frustrating, as do I. I call Roy Beggs. The Minister has referred to how already some supermarkets are indicating that they may be withdrawing from aspects of the Northern Ireland food retailing market. But this is much wider than that. We've had our garden centres indicating difficulties in supplies. We've also learned of potato uh, producers having difficulty in accessing seed potatoes, which comes mainly from Scotland. And indeed, this will affect virtually every aspect of movement of goods across the RIC unless reasonable accommodation is made. So my question is, Minister, what is she and the First Minister and Deputy First Minister actually doing to minimise the disruption to our economy? Um, again, can I thank the member for his question. What he outlines is obviously um, and absolutely true and the reason why uh, when I had the opportunity as a member of the European Parliament to vote on this, would not vote on this because of the implications of the protocol for Northern Ireland businesses, something that I have warned this House over and over and over again about. Um, I have outlined to you the actual practical measures that are currently in, in place. We need clear information uh, on these matters. And can I um, advise the House that I speak weekly, indeed many times during the week, um, to uh, members of Her Majesty's Government on the issues in relation to the protocol. 
um, issues uh, around uh, the supply of goods for the manufacturing chain from GB to Northern Ireland, issues um, around uh, how Northern Ireland milk products will be treated um, should uh, some of those uh, be processed in the Republic of Ireland, um, issues um, about um, our parcels that simply will arrive from GB to Northern Ireland. There is much that the Joint Committee can do to make these things um, easier to bear for the people of Northern Ireland. And I would appeal in this last uh, round of negotiations that uh, the European Union would get serious about doing that if it is serious about protecting Northern Ireland and its consumers. And I call John O'Dowd. Can I call your case, Jeffrey Kerr? Question number four. Again, can I thank the member um, for uh, his question? Following discussions with um, NUS and USI officials, um, we have developed advice for students across a range of issues relating to the impact of COVID-19. This advice has been published on the NI Direct website. It covers everything from safety and travel, finance and support, health and welfare, exams, placements and graduation. For further education, it refers to all of the above and also gives advice around apprenticeships. In addition, uh, my ministerial colleagues in the executive office, along with the chief medical officer, the public health agency and officials from my department have convened meetings with the universities, the main purpose of which has been to ensure the safety of students on campus. The universities have been working closely with the public health agency to ensure that they are providing advice to students which is fully in line with the agency's guidelines. This advice includes information regarding what support is available to students, including for those students who are self-isolating, as well as the expected behaviour from students. Further education colleges have been provided with a framework for recommencing on-site educational provision. This document provides practical guidance about how students and staff should prioritise their own and others' safety in relation to COVID-19. In addition, my department requires the colleges to provide students with an extended induction process to ensure that they understand the policies and procedures in place to protect their safety. John O'Dowd, supplementary. Uh, I'll thank the Minister for her answer thus far. Uh, the Minister will be aware that students have had a particularly difficult year, particularly first-year students who have been awaiting their A-level results and then the, the mix-up around those. Uh, they are now seeing their studies disrupted. They are facing financial hardships because many who have part-time jobs uh, do not have those part-time jobs any further. And plus, they have the, the worries about living and dealing with COVID as well. The Scottish Government on Friday awarded £1.32 million pounds to assist in students' mental health and well-being. They are going to assist uh, dedicated officials to engage with students, to counsel students around their mental health. Will the Minister undertake to work with the Health Minister to bring forward a similar proposal to the Executive where we have dedicated funding for our students' mental health and well-being? Can I thank the member for what is an incredibly important question, and indeed not just for students, but I think that COVID-19 has placed an enormous strain on mental health and well-being right across all our communities with all age sectors and all people. Um, and I think that we will see the impact of that, sadly, in the years to come. Indeed, many people have indicated um, that it could be an impact similar to that of 30 years of violence. Um, the member is very well aware that I have lobbied um, very hard for additional funds for students uh, for hardship. And in fact, actually, um, this financial year, uh, there is a student hardship fund spread across the universities totalling about £5.6 million. That's the highest uh, total of hardship funds available to students in any part um, of uh, the United Kingdom. My officials have also conducted a review of mental health provision within the higher education sector and we are pleased to note a robust and proactive offering across uh, all of the institutions. However, 
I am acutely aware of the impact of COVID on our uh, health, and I will commit to having um, conversations with the health minister around this to see if there is a need to do more to ensure that students, particularly those young students who have come up uh, straight to university from A-level, have the support and protection they need. I call Meg Nesbitt. Mr Speaker, on the 29th of September, uh, Sammy Wilson MP said that the climate of fear deliberately created by ministers and their advisers has done untold damage to individuals and to the economy as a whole and has now hit students and universities. He then challenged uh, Gavin Williamson, the Secretary of State, asking uh, whether he believed it's fair that universities still hold on to the money paid to students when they are not offering the student experience that they promised. Does the Minister agree with her party colleague? Can I thank the member for his question? It is indeed um, very topical and actually a, a particular question uh, that I am asked a significant uh, number uh, of questions about every week. Um, as the Minister responsible for higher education, um, I am responsible for policy but not uh, for fee setting. And that is where the particular responsibility lies in this particular issue with the actual universities themselves. However, I am clear with universities that they need to be um, providing a wide ranging uh, set uh, of um, teaching uh, methods um, and an appropriate uh, assessment method for students within their universities. I continue to monitor that and to ensure that our students are receiving the best education they can in the very, very difficult circumstances that universities have to operate in. If there are indications to the contrary, I will be happy to take action. I call Jerry Carl. Uh, during the year where students have been primarily taught remotely in order to remain safe, does the Minister agree with me that further pushing students into uh, debt uh, at this time to make them pay tuition fees uh, when they are abiding by public health measures in order to stay safe is unjustified? And what plans does she have to ensure the students don't rake up further debt uh, at this time? Um, I think that the issue around tuition fees uh, is one that we probably will debate. Um, at a further time within this House. Um, what I am clear about for students um, in this particular COVID era is that they are safe, that they are taught by a variety of methods and that they receive the best possible teaching that they can in the circumstances they can. If there are indications to the contrary, I will be happy to take that up uh, with the universities um, because I do think there is nothing more important to young people uh, than receiving an appropriate education and the future of our economy and the stability and prosperity of Northern Ireland relies upon it. Minister, for your answer so far, and I suppose my question has been answered already, but I, I'll ask. Uh, in relation to the student experience being so diluted um, at the moment, I'm really concerned about some of the students that are currently um, held into contracts for accommodation um, in England and Scotland and Wales. Would she join or commit to join with the other devolved governments in pushing for students to be released from, from contracts for accommodation so that they can return home and study uh, remotely instead of being tied in and being isolated in a place where, 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 where they do not have any uh, backup or support? Well, of course, much of this will vary from university to university. Um, here in Northern Ireland, I understand that Queen's University has already offered young students in halls of residence uh, a holiday payment for this particular term uh, because of the difficulties that some of them will have experienced um, through having to self-isolate uh, during this very, very difficult uh, period. Um, and uh, many students as well have private uh, accommodation, which again offers its own particular difficulties of that contract between landlord uh, and tenant. 
That is why I moved uh, during the year uh, to provide additional funds in the hardship funds for our universities. And should um, it be indicated to me that we need uh, to be more proactive again in lobbying for more funds, I will not hesitate to include that in the January monitoring round. And that ends the period for a list of questions. We will now move on to topical questions for 15 minutes. And I call Sean Lynch. Good to can call you. Minister, on the 22nd of October, you announced support for businesses impacted by restrictions for both those directed to close and within the, the supply chain. Only the scheme for those directed to close has opened for application. I'm hearing from businesses are in financial difficulty as a result. How quickly do you expect payments to be made, and when do you expect the scheme to be open for those in the supply chain? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the, the support package for businesses is really around two particular uh, supports, uh, one led by the Department of Finance and the other led by my own Department in Economy. Um, for uh, those instructed to close um, and who have business premises, the Department for Finance is offering uh, a solution uh, in relation to that. Um, and I am really looking at those who have no uh, business premises to operate out of, uh, particularly, um, I don't know, mobile hairdressers, driving instructors, etc. As of the 9th of November, we had 2,170 applications uh, and 106 of those verified, and the first payment run was made last Friday as well, representing £127,000 in assistance. I will uh, seek to have that uh, progress as quickly as we can, but obviously, given the fact that we need to do the verification checks that are very, very important in ensuring that public money is well spent. Part B of the scheme is really around the supply chain, um, and we should have the final paper to the executive in relation to that uh, probably tomorrow. Sean Lynn, supplementary. Uh, I want to thank the Minister for her answer. Again, on, back in October, you were allocated funding for the newly self employed. Many of these people have not received a zero um, support to date. Can you please tell them when they expect finally to get much needed support? Thank you. Um, there are a, a number of issues around bringing forward a scheme for the newly self employed. And I recognise the real uh, financial difficulties um, that they have been in. Um, and one is the verification and the cooperation from uh, HMRC. Um, that has been difficult as part of the process. But again, we should have an executive paper uh, for the executive to make a final decision on this week. Call Keith Buchanan. Thank you. And thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Um, Minister, many people are working from home at the moment. Many students are, are studying from home, many pupils at school, teachers, etc. Rural businesses are trying to operate online, equipment, etc. Et Can you give us an update where we're at with Project Stratum and how near we are to implementing that? Um, yes, um, we are uh, almost at the end of the legal processes in relation uh, to uh, Project Stratum, and I hope to be in a position to make an announcement uh, very, very soon to the uh, Assembly and the Executive um, as to the progress that that has made. That will ensure uh, that many, many businesses covering a about 97 per cent, I think, of it is in rural parts of Northern Ireland, will have access to fast uh, speed broadband. That will not just help um, in a COVID uh, situation, but that will help with the competitiveness of our economy and the ability of rural communities um, to be um, more competitive and productive. Keep your can supplementary. Thank you, and thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Obviously, there will be a lead-in time with regard to get that implemented. Is there any uh, conversations ongoing, or have you had conversations with current providers to basically up or boost what we've got at the moment to get a, a, you know, an initial better speed at some places, an, an easy, quick win? We have, uh, of course, had a, a number of conversations, and just last week um, I was really uh, glad to announce um, further um, progress in, in this particular area. Um, 
The project stratum is a long-term intervention in the economy, but it is a hugely, hugely important intervention and will uh, make sure that Northern Ireland has uh, almost full coverage in all parts of Northern Ireland. I look forward to that. I think that that is an aspect of delivery uh, that the executive can be proud of, that this assembly can be proud of, um, and that we in the Democratic Unionist Party, having lobbied for this under the confidence and supply deal, can also be proud of. Nicole, Steve Egan. Okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and thank you for the Minister so far. I, I would like to ask the Minister whether she would join with me in thanking the Vice-Chancellor of Queen's University for marking yesterday the considerable sacrifice of the many Queen's students and the faculty in the conflicts that our nation has been involved in. I would, of course, join with you uh, in uh, remarking on that. I think that remembrance is hugely, hugely important. Um, for all uh, of our society and remembering those who gave the ultimate sacrifice is, is massively important for us um, as a nation and I was um, glad to see commemorations go ahead yesterday even a, in a paired back way that they were. Um, I think it's also hugely important for Queen's University to make such remembrance a priority and for the Vice-Chancellor to make it a priority, given uh, the very considerable concerns that there has been in sections of our community um, around some of the decisions uh, in the university in recent days. Steve Egan, supplementary. Uh, thank you very much indeed for the Minister. And, uh, could she, therefore, as part of the centenary celebrations that will be undertaking next year for our 100th anniversary, could she encourage the university, as part of its badly needed outreach to the unionist community, to set up an endowed chair at the university to study unionism and its contribution to Northern Ireland? And it would be particularly opposite if it was named after Edgar Graham. I, I do indeed um, think that that is um, a very laudable uh, suggestion and one that I would be very, very happy to support. Um, in my department, we are also making preparation for the centenary of Northern Ireland, looking at the economic powerhouse that Northern Ireland was um, at the beginning and in its creation, and looking firmly into the future at how we can develop the economy of Northern Ireland um, in a way that sees it fit for purpose within its second century. These, I think, are exciting um, events for us all. Um, and I know uh, in many ways uh, some in this House will consider it uh, divisive, but it will be a sign of the maturity of this House as to how it reacts uh, to the uh, commemoration of the centenary of Northern Ireland. Nicole Park, Thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Minister, businesses in Derry and Shaban have been subject uh, to additional restrictions for the past six weeks now and have been closed. And those elsewhere in my own constituency have been now closed for four weeks. The vast majority have yet to receive a single brass penny of the support they were promised. These employers closed their businesses in good faith. When will they be paid what they are owed? In my previous answer on this particular uh, matter, um, there are two aspects to the business support schemes that are currently ongoing for this uh, restriction period. And one is the scheme um, um, organised and run by the Department of Finance, where, as you rightly talk about, businesses who close their premises um, have had uh, no uh, support. Um, I recognise as someone who has considerable experience of running um, business support schemes that these are not easy things to implement and they are not easy things uh, to have verification on, particularly when you're trying to have a speed of response uh, in relation to it. Um, so therefore, uh, as I indicated, I am particularly concerned with the scheme that we are running um, around uh, those businesses that have no premises, um, and we have already made uh, the first run of payments in that. I hope that having made the initial run that we will be able to speed up the process. But again, as this House is quite rightly very concerned with, it is important that the proper processes and verifications are in place so that we can ensure that public money is well spent. Thank you, Minister. The situation facing these businesses is totally unacceptable, in my view. 
The Minister has been far too slow to support those who have been asked to close and supply chain employers affected by these decisions. Will she apologise to those business owners who are in despair this afternoon and commit to providing them with the support they need now? Sure as to which businesses the member uh, is really referring to. If he's talking about businesses that have had to physically close their premises, then he needs to refer his question and his requirement for an apology to the Minister for Finance, because that is where that particular scheme is being run. I am running a scheme for those people who have not been able to carry out the normal business that they would, people who uh, do not operate from a premise, and those people um, who um, are mobile in the way that they conduct their business. As I have said, we have moved quite quickly to ensure that that scheme is up and running. The first payments are underway, and the rest will follow in due course. Call Alan Chambers. Question and supplementary, given the time. Uh, I welcome the latest news regarding the redundancies of staff employed on HMS Caroline being postponed, Minister, until the end of the year. I understand that consultants have been working on a report regarding HMS Caroline. Can the Minister confirm if their brief contained a direction to only consider relocation sites uh, outside Northern Ireland? Um, I'm really unsure of what the um, direction of the, minister, of the member's question. But first of all, can I say I do welcome um, the news uh, and the agreement that we were able to strike uh, with the Royal Naval uh, Museum uh, in relation to those uh, people who are employed in HMS Caroline. I have made it clear for many times and on many occasions in this House that I actually indicated at the beginning of September that the department did not want to see anyone made redundant and that we were quite willing uh, to put in place the process which would ensure that those people were paid until the end of December and indeed thereafter if that were necessary. I am very committed to ensuring that HMS Caroline remains uh, in uh, Northern Ireland and that uh, this ship is open <coughs> as an important uh, historical um, um, part uh, of the Northern Ireland landscape, not just for tourism, but for the intrinsic value and, that it represents to people here in Northern Ireland. So therefore, that is the aim of uh, my department in the work that we are undertaking. I'm glad that the Royal Naval Museum uh, was able to come to an accommodation with us. I will continue to work for the, uh, with them to ensure that this ship has a full future in Northern Ireland uh, and that those who are currently employed remain so. Alan Chambers, have you concluded? Colin Wheeler now. Minister, a report published in the Belfast Telegraph last week stated that over the last seven years, higher education students here in the North saved £1 billion in tuition fees and student debt when compared to students in England. This saving was due to the Executive's commitment not to follow England and to instead keep student fees affordable. Sinn Féin believes this approach is important in breaking down barriers to education. So, Minister, can you outline your own view of that issue? I think it is extremely important to ensure um, that all of our young people have access to high quality education. And speaking um, again as someone who benefited from uh, a university education in Northern Ireland, um, and that is hugely, hugely uh, important. Um, I'm glad that the Northern Ireland Executive had a collective approach. Um, to looking at uh, the issue of student fees and that we did not follow the automatic £9,000 requirement uh, that there is in the rest of the United Kingdom. I look forward to continuing that approach. A minute left, supplementary. Colin Miller, uh, Question to answer. Okay, the, could ask member, the time is up for this uh, particular session. Thank you, everybody, for their contributions. And, uh, could I ask members just to take a raise for a moment or two to switch the uh, tables? <laughs>